there was an especially dark and cold night when Cindy Gambino's door swung open. A dripping wet man stood in the doorway. It was Cindy's ex-husband, Robert. I've killed the kids! They're in the water! I must have had a coughing fit and passed out. I woke up in the water. I couldn't get them out. There began the darkest night she'd ever experienced. Let's take a stab at this. Hi mates and welcome to Something About Murder. I'm Jay Something and every week I report on true crime from here in Australia. If that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick and stab that subscribe button until it bleeds. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so you can get notified every time we release a new video. Our videos are also available in audio form on Spotify or you know whichever podcast platform is your favourite. What happened on Father's Day 2005 shocked the entire country. Many people still struggle to comprehend it. Robert Farkerson was born in 1969. He was raised in a small community. As the youngest of four children, he was spoiled by his mother. Being a small, chubby kid with shitty eyesight, he was protected by his older siblings. His overprotective upbringing left him unable to cope with life's highs and lows. Up until he married, he never lived outside his family home and never cooked a meal for himself. From the outside, he seemed like a calm, humble kind of guy, pleasant enough. But on the inside, he was forever frustrated and always reluctant to take on adult responsibilities. For eight years, Robert worked at the Shire of Winchelsea Council before taking on a more senior role at Lidgerwood Seeds. During this time, he was involved with the local footy club. In February 1990, he met Cindy Gambino, a beautiful young lady who was still grieving the loss of her boyfriend who had recently died in a car crash. However, she found comfort in Robert's arms and the two began dating. Four years later, in October 1994, the couple welcomed their first son, Jai. Upon receiving a redundancy package from his employer in 1996, Robert invested in a Jim's mowing lawn mowing business, which was a failure from the start. The franchise, which was to operate in his local area, cost him around $40,000. He gave up the franchise and found a job as a cleaner at the Cumberland Resort in Lawn, where he worked until 2005. Robert continually dwelled on his anger and frustration after the failure of his lawn mowing business. In his mind, everyone else was at fault except him. He constantly cultivated the image of himself as a victim of circumstance. In July 1998, Robert and Cindy's second son, Tyler, was born. But by the year 2000, Cindy knew deep down there was a problem in her relationship with Robert. Even though he seemed to work hard and was an amiable person, something didn't feel right. Being immature and dependent in terms of all life responsibilities, Robert wasn't the kind of man she wanted. Nevertheless, the couple celebrated the start of a new millennium by marrying each other in August. They lived together in a rented house in the Victorian township of Winchelsea, while their own new home on the other side of town was under construction. In 2002, their third son Bailey was born. However, things had really turned south for Robert and Cindy. Robert's mother Faye had been diagnosed with cancer earlier in the year and had died before Bailey was born. Faye's death made Robert even more moody and unpredictable. And instead of seeking treatment for his depression, he was constantly taking it out on Cindy and the children, harassing and relentlessly teasing them all. Robert seemed to bully and emotionally abuse his oldest son Jai the most. Cindy, failing to reconnect with Robert, who was becoming gradually more aggressive in their relationship, felt like everything was hopelessly falling apart. And so, she decided to do something about it. In November 2004, she asked Robert for a separation and told him to pack his stuff and move to his father's place. Within days, Cindy filed for divorce and went back to her maiden name of Gambino. Robert finally sought treatment with psychologist and psychiatrist in order to cope with the separation and was diagnosed with avoidant personality disorder as well as depression and was prescribed Zoloft. Ten months later, whereas Cindy felt happier than she ever was, 
Robert was still struggling and living at his father's place. Cindy had moved on in her romantic life. She met Stephen Moles, a 38-year-old concrete contractor, when he was pouring the slab for her in Robert's home. He quickly caught her attention, and after Cindy and Robert separated, her friendship with Stephen bloomed. Stephen was divorced as well, and wanted to focus on providing a secure and stable home life for his own children first. Even though the two remained in separate homes at opposite ends of town, it was a small community where everyone knew everything about each other, and Robert felt betrayed. He hated the fact that Stephen and Cindy were together and constantly talked shit about them or complained that they were probably going to get married. According to his psychologist Peter Pepko, Robert was even planning to verbally provoke Stephen into hitting him so he could have him charged with assault. He made threats towards Stephen and Cindy saying weird things like, I have contacts, like don't you underestimate me. On the rare occasions when Robert spent time with his own kids, he told his sons that Cindy loved Stephen's kids more. A few days before Father's Day, Cindy's phone rang. It was Robert, who then endlessly complained about long working hours, the delay in selling the house, having a shit car, and rising child support payments. Hearing his seemingly endless catalogue of woes, she tried to support him and suggested he could look for a cheaper place to live. Concerned, Cindy even told him that she was willing to forget about child support payments if that would help his financial situation because, of course, she felt partially responsible for his current situation. Robert said that he was going to move to Brisbane. Cindy asked him to reconsider that idea. The kids needed their dad. He'd spoken before about going north. That was where his older brother lived. He'd even talked about setting up some sort of business up there. Cindy thought it was all just talk. He'd had a business before, right? And see how well that had gone? Hoping she could give him something to cheer up about, Cindy suggested that he should take the kids out on Father's Day. On Father's Day, Sunday, September 4th, 2005, Cindy arranged everything for her sons to spend the day with their father. It was their first Father's Day since the separation, and as she drove the kids to Robert's, she couldn't shake the feeling that everything was finally settling down after the last turbulent year. Robert was already home from work and was welcomed with gifts from Jai, Tyler and Bailey at around 3pm. Tears were welling up in his eyes as he unwrapped a photo of the four of them in a frame. As they sat in his cold and cramped place, which Cindy often referred to as a morgue, two-year-old Bailey put his hands up to his mum to pick him up. He wanted to go home with her. However, Cindy left them together, asking Robert to have the boys back at her place for 7.30pm. She knew Robert wouldn't want to have them overnight, as he never changed Bailey's nappies. Robert took the kids to KFC in the outer suburbs of Geelong for chicken and chips, which was their favourite, and then took the kids to his brother-in-law's house. At about 7pm, Robert was heading back to Winchelsea to bring the kids back home. The three boys were strapped in, sitting in the back seat of his white 1989 VN Commodore, after what seemed like a pretty good day. Bailey was asleep. As they sped along the Princess Highway between Geelong and Winchelsea, Another driver, Dawn Waite, came up behind them in her car. In evidence later, she said that the car kept alternating between braking and accelerating, and that the driver, Robert, was continuously looking to the right. As she passed them on the left, they turned right on the road between the lanes of the freeway, around two or three kilometres from Winchelsea. Suddenly, the white car screeched in darkness, broke through a wire fence, headed down a grassy ridge, and crashed spectacularly into the large rectangular dap that lay behind. The full-size family car quickly submerged in the dark waters of the dam. Robert managed to get out of the car, but shocked by the collision and panicked, the three boys were unable to free themselves. Robert didn't help them. There wasn't a star in the sky, as the car immediately sank into the freezing waters and disappeared. All three boys drowned silently in the cold night. Robert, of course, survived. As he managed to get out of the water, he climbed unsteadily back up the hill to the freeway. Shane Atkinson was driving with his friend Tony when the car in front of him swerved to avoid something. He then braked hard at the sudden sight of a soaking wet man stepping out in front of his car. Shane had a go at him. What the fuck are you doing standing on the side of the road? Are you trying to kill yourself, mate? Nah, nah, nah. I just killed me kids, Robert responded. Shane was stunned as the man burst into tears as he kept talking about having killed his kids. Robert, drenched with damn water, asked Shane for a smoke, 
and then asked, can you take me into Winchelsea? I've got to tell Cindy if they, you know, I've killed the kids. Shane looked into the darkness, wondering if the man was for real. He and Tony offered to go and swim down and get the kids, but Robert said that it was way too late. The kids were already gone. Why didn't they call triple zero? Shane was bewildered as well. Robert refused to call the emergency number after the crash using Shane's mobile phone. Instead, he wanted to personally tell Cindy about what had just happened. Crown prosecutor Andrew Tinney later stated that after murdering the children, Robert wanted the delicious reward of telling his ex-wife about the deaths. Shane Atkinson, however, was convinced that this bloke was having some kind of mental breakdown and decided to take him to wherever this Cindy woman's place was. They arrived at Cindy's house and Robert knocked on the door and entered, telling Cindy what had happened. Cindy screamed and made frantic triple zero calls, as well as ringing Shane and family members. She thumped Robert a bunch of times, pleading with him to tell her where the kids were. Robert stood alone, indifferent to everything that was happening. He told her, they've gone. Shane, who now had worked out that he was for real, drove off to get the police. Cindy ordered Robert into her car and sped off, screaming at him to tell her where they were. He told her that they're near the overpass on the freeway. But when they got to the overpass, Robert said they'd gone too far. Cindy jumped out of the car and started running towards the side, trying frantically to find the dam. It was around this time that her boyfriend Stephen found Cindy's car and parked behind it. He saw Cindy running to and fro in the darkness, wailing into her phone to triple zero. The operator had asked Cindy to describe the car or where she was, but Cindy was gripped with panic. She was still on the phone when Stephen ran down the embankment. Robert was standing motionless and silent near the highway. The first words Robert said to Stephen was, Where's your smokes? Stephen couldn't believe his ears. Smokes? He snapped. How can you worry about a smoke at a time like this? Robert's children were in the water. Water nobody could see. In a car, nobody could see. Stephen asked Robert where his kids were, and Robert told them that they were in the water. What fucking water? The night was so dark that Stephen couldn't see the dam. Where's your fucking car? Robert repeated, in the water down there. He pointed into the darkness. I had a coughing fit and I blacked out. Angrily, Stephen asked Robert why he didn't get his kids out of the car. Robert said, I tried to get them out. I'm soaking wet. Look at me. Stephen told him to get out of his fucking face or he'd fucking kill him. He saw the dam and jumped into the water. Shane and Tony, meanwhile, had just turned up and they too jumped into the water. Tony shouted to Stephen, over there, mate. Stephen took a deep breath and dived, but he found nothing. The five people heard sirens in the distance. Stephen dived again, and he still found nothing, searching with his hands in the dark, freezing cold water. He dragged himself from the water back to the bank of the dam. Robert was watching silently from the fence. He didn't jump into the water. He didn't offer any help. If Robert was upset, he didn't show it. Stephen asked him again where the car was, and he repeated that he didn't know. Stopping himself from smashing Robert's face in, Stephen headed back to the dam, telling himself to keep going, but also wondering where the emergency services were. The sirens grew louder, and an ambulance and a police vehicle arrived. By this point, it was just after 8pm. Paramedics immediately told the three men to get out of the water and wrap them in blankets, fearing hypothermia. Frozen and exhausted, Stephen limped towards the embankment. He gestured angrily towards Robert, who still had his arms folded, his chest out, watching. To Stephen, he looked like a council worker, supervising some mundane project, like when he worked for the Shire of Winchelsea. There was no emotion in his face, no pain, no tears, nothing. After a few hours, at about 2am, the boys' bodies were recovered by police divers. The police officers reported that the three boys did not have their seatbelts on, meaning they had died in panic and fear, all while struggling to get out of the car. The oldest boy, Jai, was found halfway out the car's front door. Kids must have been fucking terrified. The investigators gathered evidence and began their investigation. All the witnesses before and after the incident were interviewed, and on 14th of December 2005, three months after the crash, Police knocked on the door of Robert Farkerson's father's Winchelsea home. Robert was nowhere to be found. He later turned himself in at the Geelong police station, accompanied by his lawyer. Robert Farkerson was then arrested and charged with three counts of murder. 
Robert remained in custody until the trial, which began in the Supreme Court of Victoria in late August 2007. During six weeks, a total of 49 witnesses appeared. Cindy couldn't wrap her head around the thought that Robert could deliberately intend to kill their children, saying, I believe with all my heart that this was just an accident and that he would not have hurt a hair on their heads. I don't believe this is murder. One of the prosecution's strongest piece of evidence against Robert was that of Greg King, who retold a conversation he'd had with Robert months before the incident. Outside a fish and chip shop, Robert allegedly mentioned that he was seeking revenge on his ex-wife. One of his brightest ideas to do so was to take away the things that mean the most to her. Robert ranted about Cindy taking the newer of the two cars they had and complained about her new relationship with Stephen. Prosecution witness Susan Hattie recounted a conversation with Robert where he said that he was going to take the kids off Cindy. Susan asked whether that meant going for custody. Robert just shrugged his shoulders. Robert's defence to the incident was that in the moments before the accident, he'd had a coughing fit leading him to black out before losing control and crashing into the dam. Prosecutors showed evidence from Shane Atkinson and paramedics that he'd also claimed that he'd done a wheel bearing and that he'd had chest pains. Matthew Norton, an associate professor and specialist in sleep and respiratory medicine, testified in front of the court that such coughing fit is extremely rare. It's a condition called cough syncope. Generally speaking, the syncope might cause a brief loss of consciousness due to a drop in blood pressure or a decrease in heart rate. It might be caused by the sight of blood and needles or emotional stress, pain, or as Robert Farkerson claimed, coughing. Farkerson's thoracic specialist, Chris Steinfurt, gave evidence that it was highly likely that Robert really did experience the cough syncope that night, saying it was a classic example. Norton claimed that it was highly unlikely for Robert to have experienced it in the warm car. During questioning, he couldn't provide a rational explanation for why the submerged car's ignition and headlights had been turned off. Farkerson also couldn't explain how he changed direction three times before crashing into the dam. The owner of the farm where the dam was located admitted that a total of seven vehicles had crashed through his farm fence. However, Robert's car was the only one that actually ended up in the dam. The prosecutors questioned why Robert didn't swim back for the kids. He was 41 years of age, fairly reasonable health. Leaving the kids behind seemed unbelievably cold-blooded and devoid of any empathy at all. At least one of them could have been saved. Robert claimed that he got out of the car to go around to the other side to save them, but the water had been too deep. The prosecution didn't have much else to support their claims. Apart from Robert's psychological background, the continuous changing of his story and Greg King's testimony. Robert's friends also had a hard time believing that he was capable of murdering his own kids. Even Cindy supported him. Robert's lawyer called him a simple country bloke who has been stepped on by the world. One day before the verdict, Robert arranged for three red tulips to be laid at his children's grave. And on October 5th, 2007, the jury found Robert Farkerson guilty. Upon hearing this decision, Cindy broke down in tears and her mother collapsed on the floor. Robert Farkerson was sentenced to three terms of life imprisonment without parole. He immediately announced that he would appeal the conviction. In 2009, his conviction was unanimously overturned by three appeal judges who criticised the trial judge, the prosecution and Greg King's evidence. They ordered a retrial. On May 4th, 2010, the retrial before Justice Lex Lazary QC began. After 11 weeks of testimony and deliberation, the jury was given a break to contemplate their decision. Having deliberated for three days, the second jury once more convicted Robert guilty of murder on July 22nd. He received a 33-year minimum term, which in Victoria pretty much means life in prison. Justice Philip Cummins said, you wiped out your entire family in one act. Only the two parents remained. You, because you'd always intended to save yourself. And their mother, because you intended for her to live a life of suffering. After the retrial, Cindy was no longer supporting Robert's story. It's never going to be enough. It's a life sentence for me. It should be a life sentence for him. Robert attempted twice more to appeal the conviction in 2012 and in 2013. However, both appeals were rejected. In court for one of these appeals, Robert turned up on crutches. Supposedly, another severe coughing fit had caused him to fall off his chair and break his leg. 
he acted out the infamous coughing fit scene a few more times throughout these appeal dates. Of course, he never blacked out. Cindy Gambino and Stephen Moles eventually got married. In 2015, Cindy successfully lobbied the Victorian Supreme Court for compensation from Farquharson for his horrific act against their three children. The amount was kept confidential, but it was thought to be in the amount of $300,000. Of course, no amount of money would ever be enough to cover the pain of losing Jai, Tyler and Bailey in 2005. Sadly, Cindy Gambino died suddenly in May 2022 after suffering a medical episode at home. Her devastated family called her a warrior for justice. She was 50 years old. Robert Farquharson has earned himself a place in the pantheon of Australia's most unlikely killers. The quiet, short, stocky man painted himself as one of life's losers. He played the wronged husband card. He made people feel sorry for him and ultimately he made people believe him incapable of murder. Since the trial, he's now seen rightfully as a cold-hearted bastard who willfully escaped his drowning calf without even attempting to save his own sons. Many people have to deal with the unbearable pain involved in separating from a partner who wants to start a new life without them. When kids are involved, it's even more difficult to manage your emotions in front of them and keep them out of the arguments. Robert Farquharson, instead of trying to manage his emotions, comforted himself with resentment. He turned his attention away from the pain caused by feeling abandoned and instead devised a devastating plan of revenge. Robert Farquharson is currently serving a 33-year sentence in Barwon Prison, 40 minutes up the road from Winchelsea. He will be eligible for parole in 2039. On the freeway next to the dam where he cruelly took the lives of Jai, Tyler and Bailey, there's a shrine to the three boys. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you watching the whole video. Join me next week as we trawl through another episode in the true crime history of Australia. If you've enjoyed this video, once again, please go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick and stab that subscribe button until it bleeds. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so you can get notified every time we release a new video. Stay safe out there. Bye.